October 4, Ford Pinellas, Pinellas meeting. meeting. Why am, Why I, am I echoing? echoing? <laughs> oh my, oh my God. God. <laughs> Our, Our invocation, invocation that, that is so <laughs> weird <laughs> uh, is Commissioner Mertz, my favorite, and um, thank you for doing that, and we'll stand in the pledge after. Please join me in the invocation. Almighty Father, we ask for your guidance and wisdom while we gather here today to conduct the business of local government that will deliver to body that is closest to the people. Guide our hearts and minds in the spirit of fairness, reminding us that the primary role of leaders is one of service to and for the sake of the people. Be with and help guide this governing body to engage in meaningful discussions to move our community forward in mutual respect and common decency, keeping in mind that our decisions will have implications now and into the future. We unite here today around these noble aims and common purpose. In your name we pray, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll go to board um, <laughs> comments and uh, introducing yourself. And Commissioner Mertz, you're going to tell us who you are again. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Com uh, Commissioner Cliff Mers uh, from the City of Safety Harbor, also representing the cities of Oldsmar and Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Councilmember Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Petersburg. At Gerard, Pinellas County. Councilmember Patty Reed from City of Pinellas Park. Bonnie Noble, Kennesaw City, and I'm representing the inland communities. Julie ward Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council, and representing PSTA. Michael Smith, Vice Mayor, City of Largo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission. Good afternoon. Councilmember David Albritton, City of Clearwater. Hello, Whit Blanton, Executive Director. My name is Cookie Kennedy. I'm the mayor of the city of Indian Rocks Beach, and I represent the beach communities, and let's see if I get them right. St. Pete Beach, uh, Madeira Beach, all three Reddingtons, Indian Shores, Bel Air Shores, Indian Rocks Beach, Bel Air Beach, Treasure Island. I think that's it. Anyway, so that's who we represent. Tina, on citizens to be heard, uh, I'd like to know if there are any, any citizens who would like to be heard on any item not already on the agenda for action today. No, Madam Chair, there is not. And first we'll go to recognitions, and I'm so happy that our returning member, Commissioner Pat Gerard, is back with us, and I will turn it over to Whit Blanton. Can you put your mic on, please, Whit? Well, welcome, Commissioner Gerard. Welcome back. Um, do you want me to cover the consent agenda, the, the item we're going to pull? Yes. Okay. All right, so we have uh, a couple items on the consent, uh, one item on the consent agenda that we need to remove uh, for discussion separately, and that's 5C. It's the agreement to piggyback our contract for audit services. So why don't we handle the other ones, and then we'll handle that Perfect. one second. Perfect. Is there anyone who has any, would like to speak, any of the board members on any of the other commission items at this time? Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Thank Chair, you. for the record, there are no citizens to be heard on the consent agenda. There are? There are not. There are not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let me, let me handle the uh, other item here. This is the audit agreement. Uh, where we are piggybacking uh, uh, to use the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority's auditor, uh, Cherry Beckert, as our auditor for, for this one year period. Uh, this item, uh, we still are working on final details of the contractual language. We have a draft contract, but there's still some edits to be made. However, we have negotiated a scope of work and a funding amount for this. So at this time, we're asking for the board to approve the scope and fee 
and um, authorize me to continue negotiating with Cherry Beckert and our attorney uh, as we review changes to the contract. And the reason that we're doing this, when normally when you piggyback a contract, you take the contract exactly as it is, but uh, the PSTA contract does not have some of our federal clauses that we're required to have, nor does it have <clears throat> the consistency with the procurement um, um, issue that we encountered with FDOT uh, and Federal Highway last year. So we've made those edits to it and we're just working through those. Move approval. Is there a second? Tina, did you get that? I had the motion by Mayor Bujowski and I have a second by uh, Vice Mayor Smith. Okay. And again, for the record, Madam Chair, there are no citizens wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. We'll move on to presentation. presentation. To uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Anyone opposed? Motion carries. We're gonna move on to presentations <coughs> and or action items. We're gonna start with Council Member Driscoll on PSTA. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you so much. The PSTA board um, last met on October 5th, 2022. This was a meeting that was rescheduled from September um, 28th due to the storm. The board um, held a public hearing to approve the FY23 millage resolution and the budget resolution. Um, they both were approved unanimously. And then with the regular agenda, we discussed the land swap agreement with the city of Clearwater. We received a presentation on that, and um, we unanimously voted to approve that agreement for the land swap between PSTA and the city of Clearwater. We discussed our CEO performance evaluation, which is done each year. Board members fill out an evaluation form and um, approve any pay adjustment. And after our presentation and a review of our evaluations, the board unanimously approved a merit adjustment for uh, Mr. Brad Miller, consistent with the adjustment for all PSTA employees. Um, that concludes the notes from our last meeting. Our next regular board meeting will be held on October 26, 2022 at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Driscoll. We are gonna move on to Tibarda with David Green is gonna give us a report if you'd like to come forward. Hi, David. She does, and she's very good at it, so you're on the spot, buddy. <laughs> assessment, and this is a project idea that involves an assessment of the uh, Brooksville and Clearwater uh, CSX rail corridors, um, and uh, to identify what improvements might be needed in order to, to get them ready for passenger service, how much those improvements might cost, and what the capital and associated operating and maintenance costs might be for some sort of uh, passenger rail service. T. Barta's board is interested in hearing more information from CSX directly before deciding whether to move forward with the study or not. And uh, we have a representative from CSX who's gonna attend our October board meeting this month on the 24th, 21st to provide an update about what their plans are in Tampa Bay and answer any questions that the board might have. Uh, in the meantime, we have been moving forward with the procurement for that study in case the board does want, to, want us to move forward with it. Uh, we received proposals, the evaluation committee has discussed them already and the next step would be to schedule an interview with the uh, highest ranked proposer to ask some additional questions from them. Another project is the US-19 regional uh, BRT project, which involves uh, potential BRT service connecting Pasco and Pinellas counties along US-19. Um, work on that study is complete. Um, we evaluated potential BRT service, but it really wasn't cost effective, and we went back, the executive team, um, and made some changes to um, the, the potential scope of, of the service. Um, which we looked at further, and it still wasn't really cost effective. So we then shifted to the idea of express bus service along that corridor instead, 
And uh, the exec team met a couple of weeks ago to review the re results of that, which were very favorable. So uh, we are going to present um, those results to the TBARDA board this month as well. Uh, the gondola study we're presenting to you all today, work on that is complete. We've presented to um, several stakeholders already, Amplify Clearwater uh, and the uh, Clearwater City Council. Um, feedback has been positive so far, but we look forward to your feedback today as well. The I-275 Regional uh, Rapid Transit Project, work on that is complete. The uh, environmental and cultural assessment work is finished. Uh, we submitted the documented categorical exclusion worksheet and supporting materials to FTA last week, and we anticipate a response from them by year end. We'll uh, present the uh, final results of that study to TBARDA's board in November. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is our um, van pool program under Commute Tampa Bay has been very popular over the past probably six or seven months since the cost of gas started to increase. Uh, the program hit another all-time high. We finished the month of September with 193 van pools, which is one more than August and about 25% more than we had on the road in September of 2021. Uh, and, and demand for that program primarily is driven by the uh, Haley VA Medical Center and McDill Air Force Base. So um, it's been very successful for us. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Hearing none, thank you for your report. I'm going to ask Jared Cush, where is he at? Jared Austin to come up. He's going to do our item 6C target employment and industrial land study update. And as Jared's coming up, I just wanted to let you all know that we'll be taking action on this next meeting. Uh, this is a preview and an opportunity for you all to ask questions. Uh, make sure you're comfortable with the recommendations that Jared will be identifying, and then we'll have a little more thorough uh, uh, and, and more extended presentation at the next meeting as we ask for adoption. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and like what said, Jared Austin with Ford Pinellas. Uh, today I'll be walking through an update to the TEAL study that we've been working on. Um, just as a thing I like to always state as I before I kind of dive into this work is to just have it be clear that this is work that we have been um, working on in partnership um, with a number of different folks, um, primarily Pinellas County Economic Development. Um, and housing and community development who have really been working hand in glove with us on this work, um, as well as our consultant team, Renaissance Planning Group, uh, and their sub-consultant, S.B. Friedman. And one of the central questions that's really identified, or really, that we've really identified and, and kind of tried to wrestle with as we've been going throughout this work is, how do we continue to foster a healthy economy given competing interests for limited land in Pinellas County? Um, this is a question that the county has been dealing with for a number of years, even going all the way back to the 2008 Teal study, which, yeah. you know, really identified that we have very limited vacant land available in Pinellas County um, for new development, and those lands that we have secured that are vacant for target employment uses are critical to the future economic vitality um, of Pinellas County moving forward. And so, um, this has become even uh, uh, more of a uh, serious issue that we need to address given recent legislation such as Senate Bill 962 um, that ha does allow for the development of residential property on industrial lands as long as at least a 10% uh, threshold is met for affordable housing uses with on those developments. And so we've really just had to get serious um, at our agency with our local partners and so on and really addressing this issue. And in order to address this issue, we really had to start with a market study looking at what are really the employment types that we are looking to attract and preserve land for here in Pinellas County. Because while we obviously want as many jobs as possible, the reality is that not all jobs are equal. And those that we are willing to carve out land for in Pinellas County for the preservation um, and future, uh, future development moving forward, we need to be, have a very targeted approach in doing that. And so those industries that you see there on the right-hand side of the screen, from business services all the way down to aviation, aerospace, and defense, those are really those target employment uh, categories that we've, uh, that we've identified within this work. And in addition to them um, paying higher than average wages, which is, of course, very important for us, these are also areas that are bringing money back into Pinellas County in the tunes of billions of dollars annually. They are contributing to the gross regional product of Pinellas County. 
Uh, and so it's important to identify that and why these uh, industry typologies were selected for the ones that we really wanted to focus on for this work. Um, one of the things that really became prominent to us as well um, as we moved into this market study was understanding that within these target industry typologies, they also have different land use types that they are looking to locate on. Those four that you see on the top, they want to be in more of those class A office space environments. They're looking for more quality of life elements. Uh, they can be typically more densely urbanized um, and ultimately just want, are looking for that kind of live, work, play feel. Um, the industries that you see on the bottom are more horizontal in nature. Those are industries that typically need to have um, those hangar spaces, wet labs, warehousing, um, in order to do the operations um, that it is that they do um, for those various industry typologies. And one of the things that has come out of this work, um, in addition to understanding the differences in the space needs, is that in terms of the uh, Class A office space, this is something that really hasn't been looked at as thoroughly as possibly needed to be in the previous TEALS work. Um, and so setting aside and understanding where um, we can continue to foster and grow that, those Class A office uses that obviously can, can um, be in a more, uh, can, can be on a smaller tract of land um, and sort of grow more vertically. Um, one of the things that has also come out of this is the reality that we really do not have the vacant land space available in Pinellas County to house a new target employer that is looking to locate in more of those, those larger horizontal industrial spaces. And so the focus um, for these areas, rather than more the attraction and retention uh, or the attraction of, say, within the Class A office categories, needs to be more of a retention and retainment and improvement of the existing target employment facilities that we have that meet those um, needs that are there uh, on the bottom. In addition to this, one of the things that we wanted to look at is, you know, what is really the cost of conversion? As we go and we take a look at Pinellas County and we see which lands are most um, suitable or vital um, for continued, continued preservation um, for in target employment, we want to know why do these lands matter and what is the all overall impact of when these land, uh, economic impact of when these lands convert to other uses. So we te teamed up with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Um, they did some uh, great work for us, taking an analysis of over what is the overall economic impact if you have an eight acre tract of industrial or employment land that converts to a variety of other uses. And so starting with the first use, we're taking a look at what would the net economic impact be if that eight acre, eight acre parcel developed into those more garden style traditional residential development. You're looking at about generating a tax base of about $3.1 million annually with an overall net value added of about $5.5 million. If you go take that eight acre parcel and you develop more of those traditional manufacturing uses, you're now looking at a tax base of about 12.3 million with an overall 20.7 million value added for the county. If we look at developing a more mixed use development, so residential in conjunction with uh, some other type of class A target employment use, um, you're looking at about a $40.1 million tax base with an overall of about $46 million value added. And I'm sure you see where this is going. When we jump down to the financial services, business services category, these are some of those target employment typologies that we've identified. You're looking at upwards of $200 million tax base um, added annually for Pinellas County with a net value added uh, greater than $300 million annually. So the cost of conversion counts and matters. And it's important to understand this in terms of how we identify what lands we, we want to pick up for target employment uses and preserve for target employment uses and which lands we're willing to allow uh, convert to those other uses. And so that kind of takes us now to our land suitability analysis. And this is the part of the work where we wanted to develop sort of the typologies and understanding of what areas in Pinellas County are really heating up in terms of those office uses and in those industrial uses. And so just as we identified prior that certain target employers are looking to locate in different, uh, different building typologies, whether it's the more office-oriented environment or the more industrial flex environment, we wanted to do two separate suitability analyses that looked at which lands were most suitable for those different typologies. We looked at 
factors that funneled into this suitability analysis included site size, access to transportation, access to workforce, quality of the urban environment, walkability for those more class A office users. Um, and you can see just some of the, that heat mapping on the right there showing kind of what areas are popping up um, throughout the county and there's others as well um, that'll be presented more uh, at the November board meeting. Um, but naturally you can see there's, there's quite a few areas popping up there on that heat, uh, that heat map. Um, but overall the industrial suitability, it told us a number of things. These are some of just the key takeaways. Um, it's no surprise the vacant parcels that we have here in Pinellas County are few and far between. Um, and, you know, we've kind of been reevaluating a lot of what was taken out of the 2008 Teal study, and it had this very strong acreage based approach. If we preserve it, they will come. Um, but the reality is, is that while at a high level it does appear that Pinellas County has a lot of vacant land, the reality is, is that many of these vacant parcels are small, they're fragmented, they're sparse and separated from one another, and so they may not be as suitable for some of those target employment uses as was initially thought. Um, there's also a greater need that needs to be focused on redevelopment of existing sites to greater encourage infill on underutilized land. Um, there's also some sites uh, that came out of also our advisory committee in conjunction with the suitability analysis, and the fact is there's some areas we haven't been taking into consideration that may be suitable for those target employment uses. And so there could be areas where target employment center expansion is warranted. Um, we also find that Gateway continues to remain a key area within Pinellas County for both the Class A office suitability and the industrial suitability. And then finally, some of the urban centers in Clearwater and St. Petersburg, these, pre these present notable opportunities for future Class A office use and, and in turn target employment uh, moving forward. So with all of that, the suitability analysis, the market study, the stakeholder feedback that we've received from our advisory committee, there's been really a number of things that have come to light that have kind of been what we've essentially taken and turned into draft recommendations or draft policy recommendations um, for the TEAL's work. Um, one thing that we realize is that each t target employment center really needs a different strategy. Not all of these areas are the same or should be treated as the same. Previously, we have our target employment center overlay and it treats, it has kind of a one size fits all package. Whether you're looking at a target employment center in Tarpon Springs or in St. Petersburg, they have the same exact land use restrictions and allowable uses. And we believe that different strategies may be uh, needed to be approached in those areas. Um, one of the things that we've heard is a greater desire for mixed use. A lot of target employers, especially those Class A office users, they want a greater flexibility of uses to, to continue to encourage um, new employees um, to come work for them and also to just make them you know, more desirable for that sort of live, work, play component. Um, target industries and industrial uh, areas require you know, greater renovation and expansion in order to continue to just retain what's existing in Pinellas County. Um, and there's gonna be needed, greater place making needed um, in a lot of these areas, more of the, the office sector to make them you know, more desirable for those Class A office uses. And so one of the key approaches that we've taken in terms of how we wanna move forward, in terms of how we look at target employment centers, target employment land in Pinellas County, is really subcategorizing these target employment centers into uh, the various uh, subcategories that you see on screen, as well as picking up some new target employment centers as well. Um, so in terms of the areas we're picking up, I have a slide on that in a moment, but just a little bit about each of these target employment center categories. We wanna split these areas up based on the data we've gotten, the information we've heard, and so that they are more suitable um, for what's actually on the ground. So the target employment center local category, this is a category that's more suited for uh, your, your users that need warehouse space, they need industrial space, um, but they're typically not so much in those target employment center categories uh, and have more sort of artisan uses um, that have ultimately uh, kind of generated a certain character about that area and we want to give greater local control to the local governments for how those areas continue to develop in the future. Great example of a target employment center local is the warehouse arts district. This is an area in St. Petersburg that's done a lot of creative visioning about where they want to move forward in the future while still incorporating those industrial and warehouse space needs. The 
The other category that we've identified is suburban industrial. This is the more uh, kind of what we think of when we think of our target employment industrial users. These are the areas that really are most suited only for those traditional industrial uses and need a greater, uh, greater economic reinvestment and redevelopment to continue to exist as they are now currently and so that they may expand in the future within Pinellas County. We have the suburban office category. These are more campus style, horizontal, um, suburban office spaces, such as what you might find in, in uh, Bay Vista, in the Gateway area, that in the future could redevelop, could urbanize greater, could also incorporate a greater mix of uses so that they can develop more of that live, work, play uh, environment um, as opposed to what's maybe currently there now. Uh, and then finally, we have the Target Employment Center urban category. This is really our highest, densest use, our, our design for our Class A office users that can go more vertical uh, in terms of uh, where they can, they can locate and where they want to operate. Again, looking at more of those quality of life elements, um, locating in one of those, in um, our more downtown urban cores. Um, and that's really kind of an overview just of these different typologies. Uh, and we'll, we'll be providing a lot more in-depth information on these uh, at, our, at our November board meeting. In terms of the actually new proposed target employment centers, um, obviously I've gone over the subcategories and how we plan to subcategorize each, uh, each area within um, Pinellas County that's already been identified. And we're working through that with our local governments to see how that ought to shape up. But there are new target employment centers as well. In Clearwater, we have the countryside area, um, which there's already been a lot of great planning work around there um, to, to help spur redevelopment in the future. Um, we have the Safety Harbor Target Employment Center that we've been identifying. We have Clearwater um, and Gulf to Bay along US 19, and then downtown Clearwater as well. And then uh, finally on that map is downtown St. Petersburg, which continues to heat up in both our suitability analysis and sort of our on the ground ground truthing with our target employers who are here currently, the ones we've spoken to with our consultants, um, as terms of an area that these folks really want to locate and want to see more of that class A office space uh, oriented in. So just some next steps. Um, right now, we've already begun to meet with a lot of our uh, local governments to kind of unveil these, these policy recommendations um, to kind of get, again, to better ground truth how we ultimately intend to, to implement this and what it would li look like uh, for those local communities. Um, that's ongoing throughout uh, the months of November. Um, we've also planned to meet with our Warehouse Arts District folks who we met with uh, back in April and plan to kind of go over this with them, make sure that uh, the identifications of the TEC local category and such are, are meeting the needs that they outlined to us back then. Same with the Lelman area. And then ultimately, we want to take a lot of these findings and recommendations, bring them back to our various subcommittees, uh, and then ultimately bring the final report with a much more detailed um, overview of this, these different policy recommendations uh, to you all in November um, for adoption. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have related to target employment industrial lands. Any questions for Jir? Excellent presentation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have one. Um, part of the study was to review uh, employee skill sets during that process and, and bring back uh, a discussion of skill sets, maybe <coughs> weaknesses or gaps that may be, mm -hmm. strengths that may be. Um, how, how is that? the status of that uh, going? Certainly. Um, so as part of this work, um, in addition to having uh, our more, well, SB Friedman's been doing their more direct one-on-one -on -one calls with our target employer, uh, our target employers that are represented in those categories I highlighted earlier. We also did do um, some outreach for our smaller scale manufacturers in a, in a survey format. And we also have some data from PCED that we're kind of peeling over um, to, to take a greater look at exactly what you're talking about right now. What I can tell you, at least from what we've seen and heard thus far, um, is that, and it, call it the nature of the economy we're in right now, is that a lot of folks are telling us it's not that they are, are having troubles finding the skill sets, it's that they're having trouble finding people um, for these jobs. Um, and if they are, if they have uh, uh, folks who, who they've hired uh, to do, you know, the various work uh, suited for these various uh, typologies, um, it's, they've had a, a difficult time retain, retaining 
those employees, just with the cost of living, the higher cost of inflation. Um, we had one fo uh, individual who, who filled out our survey who said that their wages have gone up 110% over the past five years, and they're still, the folks that they have, they, they just can't retain because of higher cost of living expenses and transportation expenses that have caused them to either have to move closer to home um, for the work that they do or leave the, the field they're in altogether. So that's just some insight we've gathered thus far, but we're continuing to peel over that data. So, Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mayor. Hi. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so anything that wasn't in your heat map, um, I'm assuming you're looking to those areas would would get more flexible zoning. Is that so, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. So we believe that with the data and the analysis we've done, the work that we've done with our advisory committee, the stakeholder impact, uh, input that we've gotten, we believe that the target employment centers that we have identified um, that we're looking to pick up that we've shown on those um, that have appeared on those heat maps are the most suitable for these target employment uses. So any of the employment industrial lands that are outside of those target employment centers, we're looking to have a more hands-off approach towards in terms of what the locals, how the locals want those areas to develop or redevelop in the future. When you say hands-off approach, what do you see that looking like? Um, I mean, essentially, currently what we do now um, is if we have a land use change, um, within a target employment center or outside of a target employment center. If it's industrial or employment land, we have certain thresholds that have to be met in order for us to recommend approval of that land converting. Um, in terms of the areas outside of the target employment centers, we would be looking to reevaluate that. And while I know you can't speak for Pinellas County's Economic Development Department, but if there is an area that's industrial, that has been industrial, for half a century, let's say, um, and not in the areas that you all think have the best possibility of success, which I totally understand. W do you know whether the Economic Development Department would still continue to help maintain that in that area that's outside? Um, from what I understand, Pinellas County Economic Development doesn't really like whether or not an, a property is in a target employment center or outside of a target employment center, um, they're looking at what space is available and what they can, they can essentially market that space for. So whether or not it's in a target employment center or outside of it, I don't think would prohibit Pinellas County Economic Development from still being interested in securing an, uh, a target employer for, or an employer in general for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Tina, on 60, is Stephen Dale with us or not yet? No, Madam Chair, he has not been able to join us yet in Zoom after 1.45. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll wait and we'll, we'll move on. Uh, we're gonna go to item 6E, which is the establishment of the nominating committee, and I'm gonna let the executive director speak to this. All right, thank you. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, we normally uh, do establish a, a nominating committee whenever we have um, are up against the end of term limits for our uh, executive committee, such as we are now with with Mayor Kennedy. Uh, in in odd years, or I guess in in other years, when we have somebody who's got another year of eligibility and they're already chair, it's usually typically the board's preference to just extend that and extend all those positions. But uh, Mayor Kennedy will no longer be able to serve on our board after this year. Uh, we have um, a number of other positions transitioning and we're essentially gonna have a uh, largely a brand new board beginning in January. So I do recommend that we form a nominating committee uh, to review those interested. Your agenda packet identifies um, those board members who are eligible will continue to serve on the board. Uh, what we need today is to appoint that nominating committee to meet between now and our next meeting and develop a slate of candidates for the board's consideration. And so I would just recommend that uh, folks who are not eligible to serve in those positions 
uh, consider themselves for serving on the nominating committee, and we don't need but maybe three or four people. And if you want to be on the executive committee, obviously you can't be on the nominating committee, just so you know that. I'm Madam more Chair, than happy the, to be Madam, on it if you want. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mayor Kennedy. Yes. Um, actually, the board operating procedures do allow for members of the nominating committee to still be eligible for serving on the executive committee. I don't recommend that, but no. uh, <laughs> I guess the operating procedures don't prohibit it. That's kind of weird. Um, is there anyone who'd like to be on the? I would like to be on the nominating committee since I'll be leaving. So, uh, is there anyone else? Patty. Okay. We need Bonnie. at least Bonnie. 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 Didn't mean Patty. Bonnie. <laughs> anyone else? We could probably get away with two people doing it if we can't get anybody else. All right. Commissioner Murch, you don't want to be on it with me? <laughs> well, uh, how would it, is it just for this year? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm getting off. I'm right. only on one more well, meeting. Well, I'm getting so. off too, so then it would just be um, those of us, you know, I figured that if we're going to get off, we might as well be on the nominated committee. Okay. Yeah, okay, so there you go. How did that? I, I, did I, how did I do? I did that was well. Good. That, was that, that, was a, that was a long hook, and, but pretty good. <laughs> I'm a great fisher person, fisherman, so there you go. Okay, we got that. We're all straight? We do. Okay. We need to take a vote to affirm the nomination. I need a motion committee. and a second and a vote to approve those three board members as Move affirming the nominated. Okay, so that Gavin was Councilmember Gabbard and Commissioner Pat Gerard. You mean no debate over MERS? Well, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get me off? <laughs> no. Okay. And you'll let us know when that date is going to be that we're going to be on the do the nominating committee. And yeah, all I will work to do that. But we'll also need a vote of this board. So all in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Right. Tina will work that out and let you all know when you're you're meeting. Okay, so now we're on item 6F, which is the election of a secretary. Yeah, so this is a little bit weird, but uh, our bylaws um, state that uh, as soon as there's a vacancy, we have to appoint somebody in the very next meeting. Uh, it, it is for a, the remainder of, of Commissioner Seal's term as secretary. Uh, the duties of secretary will be virtually nothing between now and then. Um, the executive <laughs> committee uh, does meet typically twice a year. Um, but since we're having a December workshop of the board, I don't really feel a need to have an executive committee meeting at the end of the year, which we typically do, uh, to sort of begin setting the agenda for the next year. So I'm not sure that it'll really mean a whole lot other than uh, there might be something that you have to attest to um, on a contract. So it's, we're looking for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say, um, well, either one of you. I don't care who you want. Yeah. I was going to ask. Well, I, I go ahead. I have a question too. Go ahead. So my only question was it was Commissioner Seal, and then I wasn't sure Commissioner Gerard is now sitting in that seat. Is it important that we have a county commissioner? I mean, we already have Commissioner Long, right. correct? Okay. So I wasn't sure our, if our, there was some relevance there to everything's silent on that. Uh, okay. There might have been some tradition, but I don't think for the okay. next two meet months it really matters. Okay. The nominating committee will be considering all positions because this is only for the next two okay. months or so. And I was going to ask Julie Thank if you, you would consider, would you? Okay. Move approval for Mayor Bujalski. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. You can go to my director's report. If you yes. Want. Which director's report is well, next? All right. We are just flying through this agenda. Um, I. I wanted to let everybody know that uh, there are a couple things that we've been working on as far as the spotlight update and um, probably first and foremost on my mind is how do we resolve the uh, Indian Shore sidewalk issue that I alerted you about last month. Uh, the, the DOT estimate for that project came in at an astronomically high amount uh, because of some right-of-way requirements for that concept. So we have a meeting on October 19th um, next week uh, with DOT with the mayor and staff from Indian Shores to talk about some different concepts uh, that could be considered that would minimize the footprint uh, on Gulf Boulevard for that sidewalk project. 
And then what the, as that meeting, this, uh, depending on the outcomes of that meeting, then we would schedule a workshop with the town council to resolve that. I've been assured by DOT that uh, they will continue to work with us and the town uh, to um, not see that project uh, be diverted or delayed too long. We'll try to get it funded in the next work program, um, but that's contingent on coming up with a solution that's financially feasible. So that's probably the main update for uh, enhancing beach community access. The other one is uh, waterborne transportation, which Mayor Bajowski, you um, brought up at our last meeting. And I wanted to let you know that we're trying to lay the groundwork so that we can have a productive waterborne committee meeting when it's next scheduled, because I feel like the waterborne committee has done good work, has developed a policy, has developed a set of recommendations. Now we just need people to act on those recommendations. And I'm afraid if we just get the waterborne committee together, again, it'll be a great discussion, but we won't really accomplish anything. So uh, to that end, um, we have um, had some conversations with FDOT. Uh, they have created um, almost created a, a new policy that would provide more flexibility in transportation funding. Uh, it's a program called District Dedicated Revenue that would allow money if we make it a priority to be used for transit operations. And that's a big deal because it's been really hard to get state and federal funding for operations. That burden has always fallen largely on local governments. Uh, it still will, uh, but this provides a little more flexibility and ability for over a five-year period for the state to assist in that operational funding. Uh, we believe waterborne transportation would qualify as a premium transit service, which would trigger the district dedicated revenue. Uh, so it can't just be used on regular bus service. It has to be some higher level of premium service. Um, the money for the DDR program is spoken for in the current five-year work program, so we would have to consult with FDOT if we wanted to use any of that money before uh, the new fifth year and see if there's a project that could be deferred or delayed or if there, there's some additional revenue freed up. So we haven't had that conversation yet, uh, but I did talk about this new uh, flexibility with the county uh, administration and they seemed very intrigued. So we are gonna have a conversation with the county administrator about the potential of using city and county funding as a commitment to entice state funding through this DDR program. And the way it would work is in year one, we would have 100% of the cost covered by the state, and then it would be at a de-escalating scale down to zero at the end of five-year period. So that softens the initial upfront cost for operating. But it doesn't alleviate the need for ultimately a, a, a subsidy of sorts. So that's one element. The other two elements of this are, uh, we've learned that Manatee County is funding a new water taxi service between the mainland and Anna Maria Island using tourist development tax revenues, which we've been told we can't do in this county. Um, there's a couple of provisions for how that's happening. Um, they are um, funding it uh, at a level, they're, they're acquiring two vessels at $350,000 each, so 49 passenger. Their service will operate Friday through Sunday, 10.30 to 10.30 p.m., pretty much all day. Uh, they are discussing an operator, which includes the Clearwater Ferry, so that's interesting. Um, and there would be about a $300,000 per year subsidy of that service. Um, they are using their tourist development tax dollars, but it's a funding mix. It's the TDT food and beverage uh, concession um, commissions that they're receiving as well from uh, Longboat Key. Um, and the commissioners are, are on board with this idea. So it hasn't started yet. Um, and I think there's gonna be about a $10 cost. So um, they are, it's, a, it's a little higher fare than what we were talking about. Uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau has been very candid that this is probably not a self-sustaining service, that it will, just like transit, it's gonna continue to need public support. Um, and the reason that they are uh, interpreting that they can use TDT funds is that the service connects to the Manatee County boat ramp there. So there's a linkage between the boat ramp, and I'm not clear what that linkage is. Um, and they did not require an economic impact to justify use of the tourist development tax funds, which I understood to be a state law, so I'm not sure how they're getting around that. So we have a few more questions for Manatee County, but we did have an initial interview with them uh, earlier in the week. Uh, and Rodney, I don't think I stated anything incorrect there, so you were on that call. 
So we're gonna learn a little bit more, and I'm thinking what I will do when we do have the, man, uh, the Waterborne Committee meeting is invite Manatee County to come and present um, what they're doing uh, and have them talk directly to us. Uh, I'm also reaching out to Amplify Clearwater, uh, which is the Chamber of Commerce, because one of the conditions that the county administrator put on me when we talked about the county potentially stepping up and being a funding partner in this is that uh, he wanted to see the business community step forward and provide some dollars or provide some support. And we do know that the Sugar Sand Festival in the past has helped subsidize a higher level of service for the water taxi. So there is some precedent for um, the business community or, or, or that festival to be involved in this. Um, and then I'm also trying to set up a meeting with Mayor Hibbard uh, and the city manager in Clearwater to affirm their continued commitment. So I'm trying to lay the groundwork so that when we do schedule the Waterborne Committee, we'll actually have an actionable uh, request for the committee to make a recommendation to the full board um, to pursue a funding strategy. A lot of moving parts. It seems like really complex for essentially $450,000 in annual funding commitment, but these things take time, and maybe the smaller the project, the more delicate the handling. Are there any questions? Mayor Wachowski. Uh, they're not necessarily questions, just comments, if that's okay. That's sure. fine. So, as you can probably imagine, Whit and I have talked about this extensively. I can um, imagine. <laughs> and, and we're very excited about the FDOT thing. Right. What I am really concerned about is given now what we're looking at, well, first and foremost, I believe this board gave, already gave direction to go to the county to get this, you know, to, to work out that deal. So whatever this is, might end up being, is completely different. So you have, and I know you've been working with the county administrators, so nothing there. You do have authority to do that. What I'm concerned about is like you just said, the five-year plan and yada, 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 and then, you know, we're supposed to have a meeting with the Tourist Development Council and the County Commission, I think, before the end of the year, but I haven't seen the date yet. I, I don't know. Deneen's email is down if you haven't heard. Um, <clears throat> so who knows where, where they're going to be at. What I'm concerned about is this thing could start for this season if everybody just put the money up and it's not that much money. I'm not saying we still can't pursue all of those things, but we all are very aware of how slow government works. And it just seems to me it's a real shame that we can address some traffic issues, we can move our tourism folks around and some of our workers for four hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, well, and, you know, and I, I just don't see what the big deal is that everybody. I mean, we all partnered on the trolley. We still partner on the trolley, right. and so I just, I don't understand what we, why we can't go ahead and do that while we're working on all this because this is going to take another year and a half to two years before it all gets sorted out. Don't even shake your head. You no, know that. You, well. you said two years ago this would have already been done. <laughs> We've been working on this for two years now. So, and again, I'm, I'm not blaming you in any way, shape, or form. Went. I'm, I'm simply expressing my frustration for such a small dollar item. And two out of three governments are, re you know, pretty much ready to go. You know, um, I was at the commission meeting, the county commission meeting, and uh, Commissioner Edgars brought it up. I know he did, and yeah. I, I greatly appreciate that, and and, probably um, because he's heard so much about it here. And um, and that's okay because he was he was our advocate, you know, for the project, and um, just kind of watching. It was just my perception is we basically probably need to lobby the county commissioners ourselves too. Each of us who were either on that board or even any of the, the members of this board to talk to them um, about, I'm serious, no. Well, and let me just say this, what bothers me is that we were told, the committee was told, our staff team was told, we're not going to give you anything until you present a plan. We present a plan, and then nothing was done with that plan. And they were presented the plan in February. 
So it's like, okay, you asked for the plan, we gave it to you, and you, nothing? No, yes, no, maybe so, we're not doing it, well, we're not I interested. Well, I think you also need to um, also lobby the county administrator because, you know, at the end of the day, any of the monies, some of the monies are going to be coming, and, and he has to be on board with this too, you know, and so. Well, that's who I'm speaking of. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I think that's, in watching what went on, I think that that, I mean, I don't know, Pat, do you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> I'm not sure you want me to weigh in. Welcome. Um, <laughs> I will say that the plan that we were presented with included not just the Clearwater Ferry, but the St. Pete Ferry and the Clearwater Transit Center and ferries to go all the way down the beach, you know, in successive years. It was not a small amount of money. No, and, and um, I'm not referring and at to that piece. Last meeting, we just allowed the county administrator to go and negotiate with. Clearwater, or with PSTA about the Clearwater Transit Center, which is up to $10 million. Yeah. You know, we're at, the county commission is not in a big hurry to, I mean, <laughs> were you listening when we were talking about the Cross Bay Ferry? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. nobody's in a big hurry to be spending operating funds for ferries out of the county budget. So, yeah, is it a big lobbying effort? Probably, but... It's also going to take some time because we don't have that kind of money laying around just to operating money is a whole different thing from capital money. You know, no, I, I get that. And that and so, plan, that plan that was presented but that plan was like everything. Yeah, because forget, that's what we were what asked for. I the bottom for. line was, but it was huge. Unfortunately, that's what the county asked us to do. Well, or we would not have. And then we submitted I think something it got separately on a bit, actually. But after it got out of here, got piled on a bit. No, um, I, I don't disagree with you on that one either. But then in so. February, all we were talking about was get the service we originally had up and running. Right. Well, and there was a, a lot of support now. for the Clearwater Ferry before we got railroaded into paying for the Cross Bay Ferry. And there may still be support there. It's just going to, unfortunately, everybody else wanted money at the same time that Clearwater Ferry did. So. We need to wade through all that, and yeah, the lobbying has been extra strong on the other issues, and not on this one. So, well, because so we, I think uh, yeah. Mayor Kennedy's right. We were allowing Witt to do his job, and well, not trying to get in the way. That's not fair either. You know, it's like he did well at the meeting, and he yeah. no, I know he, he did. He did very well, and you know what? We have a plan now. We have this new piece with FDOT, and you know what? Unfortunately. I'm glad you're on that board <laughs> because um, it, it helps when you have somebody that is a super advocate. And did you want to say something? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, All and right. I, I think what we wanted to do, you know, why we wanted to meet as the Waterborne, and I get what you're trying to do as well with, it's just, you know, what the smaller group is focused on one thing, right? I wanted to talk strategy the lobbying, the piece, all those pieces of it. I wanted to have those dialogues when we had it. And so, I mean, the year will be over and we won't have met. And then the new budget will start to get worked on for January and February. And Well, I mean, we're here now. And so I think, you know, we're having this conversation now. So, I mean, I, mean, I think that that's, it's important for all of us who are on the waterborne. David, what do you think? You're on there with us. I mean to, you know, lobby and talk about being on there for two years and, and you know, the platform and, and, you know, what we think it brings to the table for congestion and, you know, getting some of these cars off the streets and tourism. I mean, do you think that's a good idea that we, you know, speak to the county commissioners and also the county administrator and where well, are you? I agree that uh, you need to make the project that we presented starts with the Clearwater Ferry and right. goes south. Um, uh, and I was kind of hoping to uh, see something out of it, not the whole thing. I know it was a, a very pricey uh, project, and I figured that's going to take years to get everybody on board with. But um, I thought we had a good um, number, and I mean, we're ready to go. Um, you know, we're redoing the Clearwater Marina next year. 
Um, and we are figuring that we're gonna put a couple of uh, slips in there for the ferry, for the upgraded ferry, not just the one that we have now. So, um, you know, these things do take time though, I realize that. They take, even though we worked on it for um, a couple of years and came up with it, I think we came up with a good plan. It's almost like David Green and, you know, the, uh, the whole um, idea with a gondola. I mean, that's a great idea, but that's not gonna happen next year. Um, you know, we've gotta start talking about it first, council, and then we have to move it forward. It's almost like a, any kind of plan with transit. I mean, you start talking about it and five, six years later, then it starts to happen. So I, I'm hopeful that we can move it forward this coming year. Um, at least get something planned where we can start it. And, you know, I'll, I'll bring it forward with uh, city council in Clearwater and hopefully, uh, you know, we can talk about it with the county too on coming on board with the beginning of it and seeing how it'll transition on down the way. Why don't we have Witt do what he's, yeah. all the comments that you made and, and then maybe we can, you can give us an update. I am working diligently to, to get all the pieces in, in place. I, I, I do want to just mention, though, we, we, we've had several funding needs that we went to the county for, and we've started checking them off, right? So the first one was we needed our budget approved. The county commission did that. So thank you, county commission. Uh, so we now have a sustainable funding source for the, for the future. Second was the intermodal center at Clearwater, and the county has committed up to $10 million for that. Uh, that, well, maybe not yet formally, but you're, you're in principal agreement, I guess. And, you know, I got the same re response when Brad Miller and I went to the county administrator and, and that was the primary ask and the water taxi. I got the same response for both of them. So it shows that progress can be made. And um, I'm, I'm really thankful of the county for doing that. So I think this one's next. I think this is one we can work out and we've just got to, overcome some of the principal issues that, that are in, in the mix. So if I can, if, oh, go ahead. I will be personally very interested to see what Manatee County is doing with the TDC mon money, especially in terms of operating, because that's been completely off the table for us. Right. Uh, it is, even if it's allowed by statute, it still has to go through the TDC for a change and then through the county commission for a change and then bring specific projects. So, so that's that will what we take need. some time, but I don't know if it's, if our attorney will say it's legal or not. I think ours is a little more um, right. conservative than so, some. So that's exactly what I was gonna bring up. I mean, I think speaking as a waterborne committee member, subcommittee member, and also mm -hmm. speaking as a forward panelist board member and speaking as a TDC member. Last I spoke to Steve, the, I, the idea, and I'll say capital, I understand that this is not capital, but the idea of a bed tax going towards um, some capital items that are tourism related, like transportation, even if it's to purchase the ferry itself, right? There's a softening to that. There's an opening of the mind to that. Um, and if this, if this meeting is happening, I thought I heard it was gonna happen in December. I don't know that. But if it is, well, wouldn't it be great if we had the county administrator there advocating for that? Because it's not coming out of his budget, right? And it is a tourism related item. So. It is his budget. Yeah, it is. Well, but you know what I'm. But you know what I'm saying. It's not coming out of your general fund or your penny or anything else is what I'm saying. Huge asks coming forward for that one too. So just gotcha. be aware, timing is everything. Well, and that's that coordination, I guess is what I'm saying, is missing. I'm not saying it's, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to condemn anybody when I say that. I'm saying like, I, I don't know where the county administrator stands on it. And I, last time we had a, a group meeting with the county commission and the TDC board, it was an absolutely not answer. 
but I feel like that's changing. And so that meeting would be really important as to not to necessarily get a full on answer, but to get a sense of where does everybody stand and what are the next steps to look into things. But there should be some kind of plan for how to how to unfold that at that meeting, you know, maybe working with Steve, maybe working with the county administrator. I, I, I don't know what that is. That's and I feel like that's not doing. my role. Well, I, I think that's what he's doing. I mean, I think that's the step that we're going in. So, right? Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. All right. And he can, he'll be back with us. He'll talk to us. We have two more meetings before then, yeah. right? Okay. All right. Uh, no, just one, one yes, real quick thing. Yes, absolutely. That, um, I, I, I think sometimes, I mean, and again, I'm not, I think the county doesn't like to just be a, a, a checkbook. Uh, I mean, they want to be a part of the strategic review of anything that we that we're involved in whether it's you know uh, the use of tdc funds or whether it's uh, waterborne transportation whether it's i mean we did the saint pete thing for a few years and now this thing and then we put a waterborne transportation committee together which i think was great again at, at, at this operation so i think we're trying to keep everybody in the in the loop but i think it's really important that we kind of keep moving things along Nothing's ever going to be fast enough for my, the mayor down at the end I of the table. Um, but um, but that's okay. That's all right. She, She's she needs to, me, she needs to do scary. her thing, and that's, I'm, I'm all I'm all in support of that. I'm just saying it's it just it just needs to be a little bit more methodical. Um, I do think if we keep the the the, the pieces in separated because we don't. It's like you don't have to do all of it before you do any of it. Right. So it's like you can do little pieces. Um, that makes sense in the overall picture. So, um, well, I know, think again, that's probably part of the conversation, right, Whit? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, right. And I think that, you know, to your point, is that we can, we don't have to do, you don't have to commit to everything. But um, I too agree with Commissioner Gerard. I think we absolutely need to understand this whole use of TDT, TDC funds and, and what latitude we have. I know that the TDC will be wanting to be very protective of a certain part. That, I think it's a, it's a 60%. Yeah. You know, the other 40%, it's almost like, you know, go for it. But there, there are some, uh, aside from the one thing out there, we've kind of taken care of a lot of capital requests for with TDC funds. Um, there's just that one thing out there that could be a big one. So we don't know what demand that's going to be on our funds. So otherwise, something like this would be small. Right. Okay. One other thing there's I wanted a, to mention. two things with Clearwater Phillies. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, the Phillies Especially is getting bigger the by the minute. the paper today. It was I, in, that's going to get bigger than the other one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I do want to mention one other thing. Uh, we had a meeting finally with the Department of Transportation about uh, US 19 North. And um, short story is we are going to schedule a workshop with this board in the spring to uh, present some options and alternatives for US 19 north of Tampa, Nebraska because we agree that interchanges need to be built at Curlew and at Tampa, Nebraska. Beyond that, there still is some debate and there are some feasible options uh, there. Um, the department walked us through that. Um, it was a request that we made back in 2016. We finally have the numbers, we finally have the analysis and, and it was helpful. Um, so we'll share that with you and we will be planning a workshop with the business community uh, in the Palm Harbor, Tarpon Springs area as well, so that they can understand the alternatives and trade-offs prior to us uh, formalizing our priority list for next year. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. And David Green already talked about the um, US 19 Express bus service. I am thrilled and uh, very excited that um, it looks like we have a project. And um, I wanna thank T. Barta and I wanna thank their consultants for really working with Pasco and Pinella staff uh, the transit agencies, the MPO staff, to come up with a workable transit option that is a f that is financially feasible. Um, but that's going to be another one where we're going to look to where are the local dollars to operate that service, and that's probably going to be a city, county, or county, county um, partnership, uh, because nothing happens with state and federal money if you don't have local skin in the game. Um, so we'll have that conversation w at the right time. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention uh, under my director's report before we go back to the gondola presentation is the legislative committee met uh, earlier today. 
Uh, for the first time in a while, we have four members of the Legislative Committee. Uh, when we get a new board in January, we'll probably add a couple people to that committee. Uh, they reviewed a draft set of policy positions. I think they're pretty comfortable with those positions. Uh, we are going to be looking at adding a, um, a policy statement about um, holding virtual meetings of appointed boards that don't require a physical quorum. I think I've talked to you many about that in the past. Uh, and then we had Mayor Wills from uh, Reddington Shores, uh, or Reddington Beach, I'm sorry, um, come and talk to us about uh, a, a preemption preemption bill which uh, would essentially allow local governments to opt out of a preemption if it comes from Tallahassee within, about a, within a period of time after that preemption is passed. I think it's an intriguing approach. Uh, so we'll share that with you as well at our next meeting. And I think that's it for my director's report. Is, um, excuse me, yes. Um, Whit, as part of that report, we need to have this board affirm the election of Vice Mayor Reed as the chair for the Thank legislative you. committee. Thank you. Forgot all about the important news. We, uh, the committee voted to elect uh, Patty Reed as the chair of the legislative committee. So we need the board to affirm that today. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank Who you. made the second, please? Okay. okay. Madam Chair, also yes. for the is, record. Is Stephen Dale here? He is. Madam Chair, before you move on, I just want to state for the record that under item 6E, establishment of a nominating committee, item 6F, election of the secretary, as well as the um, affirmation of Vice Mayor Reed as the chair of the legislative committee, there were no citizens to be heard on any of those items. Thank you. Thank you. If Stephen Dale is ready for his presentation on the gondola feasibility study. I'm here. Hi, Stephen. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. Excellent. All right, do you just want me to take it over from here? I do. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much, everyone, for uh, having me. My name is Stephen Dale. I'm principal with uh, SCJ Alliance. Uh, we're an architecture, landscape architecture planning engineering firm, and we also happen to have a specialty in uh, cable car systems. And we've been leading this study for T-Barter for about the last year and a half. So uh, we're coming to the end of the study and I'm just going to be presenting our findings. They're gonna be fairly high level. Um, and uh, you know, please hold your questions till the end. We're gonna have a little Q&A session afterwards um, and uh, we'll just go from there, okay? So let me share this and make sure everybody can see. Everybody can see that? We can. We can. Perfect, all right, okay. so. Uh, obviously, we're here to discuss the Pinellas Aerial Gondola Feasibility Study. Um, the purpose of the study really was, was fivefold. It was A, to determine if gondolas were well suited to the Tampa Bay area. If you'll recall, we were tasked originally with looking at a project in, uh, the, uh, in downtown St. Pete in and around the pier and the waterfront, and we were also tasked with looking at a project in Clearwater. About halfway through the process, um, it was determined that there wasn't really a lot of interest in the St. Pete project from a political and a bureaucratic level. Um, people just didn't quite see the need, didn't quite understand what the purpose was of it. And so what we decided is to, to cease work on the uh, St. Pete portion and focus our attention solely on the Clearwater portion, which uh, everyone that we consulted with seemed to have a much better grasp on why we were looking at Clearwater rather than Pinellas. Um, second point where, you know, are there suitable alignments to serve Clearwater really from a technical standpoint? Are the routes technically feasible? Are the projects financially viable? And is the public at large generally supportive of the project? Um, at the beginning of the process, we conducted a pretty extensive stakeholder feedback uh, process. We probably met with about 48, you know, three, four dozen stakeholder groups or individuals in that, both at the political, bureaucratic, agency level in that. And there were very, very common themes that came up regarding Clearwater. Um, there was strong interest in this idea of connecting downtown and the beach, this idea of unification. But what was interesting is when we first started this process, we, we thought of it as about getting the tourists to leave their cars downtown and you know use the gondola to get to the beach. What we learned through this, the engagement process is the opposite was equally as important. Uh, people wanted to see the tourists that were already at the beach being able to get to downtown. You know, you've pedestrianized Cleveland Street, you've got the Imagine Clearwater, 
uh, you know, Coachman Park redevelopment going on. You've got a lot of new developments coming online in downtown Clearwater. So this idea was, how do we create this singular unified economic district, the aquarium, the beach and downtown, and eliminate friction of movement between those destinations and allow people to move free, freely and easily between those destinations. Um, there was also desire to see the, the gondola reducing traffic on the Memorial Causeway Bridge, or at the very least the perception of traffic, because sometimes that's just as important, if not more important. And then lastly, we got feedback that said we should proceed with a sort of optionality perspective. At the time that we were doing this work, the city of Clearwater was really not in a position to say where they definitively wanted a station in downtown, nor at the marina, or on the beach, I should say. So. Um, we had to proceed from a perspective where we could do our analysis, but we still allowed the city and the various stakeholders to have some freedom to change where stations might be located in the future. Uh, this led us to a, a variety of purpose and needs uh, statements. Uh, again, create a singular unified economic district. We want to disaggregate activity from the beach. It's about taking that activity and spreading it out throughout the downtown Clearwater area minimize the friction of travel, alleviate congestion, provide convenient access to the aquarium, downtown Clearwater, Clearwater Beach, or Coachman Park and the beach, um, potentially relieve some hotel, restaurant, and beach capacity constraints. We all know that, you know, Clearwater Beach is reaching its limit of what can be developed there. And if any more development is going to occur in the region or in the area, you're probably going to be looking more at downtown. Um, so that was one of the needs as well that was uh, voiced to us. Another really common theme was this idea of wanting improved employee access to the beach. Everyone we spoke to said that this was an issue, that it was also cost prohibitive for businesses to uh, have to subsidize the parking for the, the uh, employees. And also, just because of the traffic on the causeway, they needed their employees to be able to get to work reliably and on time. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and lastly, <coughs> sorry about that. And lastly, connect with transit as well in a future phase. <clears throat> so in terms of the first question, are aerial gondolas well suited to the area? This is really about environmental concerns, you know, things like rain, wind, lightning, marine environment, et cetera, et cetera. This is common in the cable car industry. There are systems literally around the world. The most lightning prone city on earth or area on earth is Singapore. I think Tampa Bay is second or third to Singapore. Um, and Singapore has two cable car systems operating year round with, with little issues. Uh, the technology we've chosen allows for heat, heat, not heating, but air conditioning and climate control of the cabins as well. So for example, these four systems here, this is in Vietnam. This is a pure tourist play, but it's going over salt water and connecting multiple islands. It goes about five miles in distance. It's quite a long system. Koblenz, Germany is more of what we would call a hybrid system. It plays a role as public transit and it plays a role as um, a tourist attraction. Bol <coughs> Bolzano, Italy, similar situation. But perhaps for this group, the most important uh, example is in Toulouse, France. This system just opened this year and it's fully integrated into their public transit system. It is considered the same as a subway, as a bus, as a light rail. It's just part of their transit system. So again, this isn't something really new. It's sort of relatively new that cities are using it as public transit, but this has been going on for a long while now. In terms of are there suitable alignments, there are, there's many different versions. This here, what you're looking at is what we call a rope line profile. It gives you the general idea of where the towers would be in relationship to the features, both man-made and, and mother nature along the route. This is just one version of it. It's important to understand we have a lot of flexibility where we can shift tower locations, we can change tower heights. We can do a lot based upon the feedback we get from stakeholders. For the purpose of this, we just went for a fairly cursory uh, standard version of a rope line profile, but at future stages, if there are future stages, we can optimize this to really get the stakeholders what they're looking for exactly. Um, in terms of the alignment, basically you have to break it into three parts. You have to look at it from the west angle point, which would be connected to the aquarium via pedestrian bridge. We've consulted with the aquarium. They're extremely enthusiastic about the project and would like to be involved in future stages to figure out where that location is. Um, then there's the marina station area. Again, there's probably three or four different areas that we could target. 
Um, from the aquarium to the east angle point, there's no difference, no matter where we put the stations. This section will be common amongst all of them. They've been shifted as far south as we can to uh, not infringe upon privacy of, of island states. We're also suggesting bringing the cable car fairly low to the ground, not to, you know, not to hit pedestrians, obviously, or anything like that. But you know, you're going to be in a situation where the lower you are, the less of a visual intrusion you'll have on people's homes in the surrounding area. And then on the east angle point to the downtown station, we've identified really four different areas. We've identified the Harborview site next to the library, the old, the old city hall site, and the uh, Pinellas County parking garage site. All of these are viable. There are other areas that are viable. The one area that is not viable is this gray area here. And the reason is we would have to run parallel to the causeway, and that's just not gonna work from a technical standpoint. <clears throat> in terms of the route specifications, we're anticipating it to be 9,500 to 10,000 feet. The system would travel up to 17 miles per hour. Cabins would allow for 28 seated passengers, so everyone gets a seat. Um, and the system capacity would be up to 3,600 PPHPD, which is persons per hour per direction. We can design it for higher than that if required, but based upon our analysis, we feel that that is, that is the maximum that will be required for this system. Uh, the wait time between vehicles would be as low as 28 seconds, which we all know wait times are the one of, if not the main thing that causes people to choose for public transit versus the private automobile. The trip time would be as low as 11 minutes from downtown to beach, and obviously it would be not susceptible to mixed traffic, which obviously any other improvements that go along the causeway, unless you're building your own private right away, um, you're going to be stuck in traffic just as all the cars and buses are right now. Um, in terms of the first mile, last mile connectivity on both sides, in terms of beachgoers, we've identified that there's sufficient and more than sufficient parking in downtown Clearwater to deal with the demand required. And the cost of parking in downtown Clearwater is a fraction of what it is on the beach. You know, it's 50 cents an hour, whereas you can be paying easily 40, 50, 60 dollars a day at the beach, and that's without in out privileges. Obviously, parking rates vary, but the reality is there's a map, it costs a lot of money to park on the beach, and it costs virtually nothing to park downtown. So we feel the delta between those two would enable, you know, enable people to pay the price required to ride the gondola, um, plus get a nice experience out of things. Um, further, the parking is underutilized downtown during the busiest times. It's primarily office workers and government workers. Most of those people don't work on weekends and holidays, which is when the beach is going to be busiest. So again, we have tons of parking downtown and most of it is going to be completely empty when we most need it. So rather than thinking about building a new parking garage, our idea was how do we utilize the capacity that's already there? And what we thought was we could do this using basically a ballet concept. It's familiar to, to Floridians. It's all over the place. And the basic idea would be rather than you parking at an ancillary parking deck, dragging your kids, your cooler, your dog, your lawn chairs, whatever, what have you, you'd be able to drive up to the station, unload your car, hop in the gondola, valet takes it to one of the satellite parking facilities. And then the nice part about this is on the other end, when you come back, you have an 11 minute journey. So when you swipe your ticket on the return leg, that would immediately send a signal to the valet land side, who would then have an 11 minute period of time to get you your car so it's waiting for you when you get there. Again, this goes back to that idea of frictionless travel. We wanted this to be as easy an experience as possible in order to encourage people to use it. Um, other, inter other last mile issues, you know, we, we've spoken with the Jolly Trolley, they would be uh, interested in collaborating with us to adjust their routes to help solve some of these last mile, first mile problems. We also looked at micro mobility solutions, autonomous travel, the transit, and also, you know, luggage porters, essentially people to help you get your stuff from the gondola to where you want on the beach. In terms of the existing user groups, we really identified four major groups. We identified residents, beachside employees, tourists staying at the beach, and aquarium visitors. And a last group that probably should be listed here, but isn't is what we call local tourists. So these are people who don't frequently go to Clearwater Beach. You, you know, they are residents of the Tampa Bay area, but they're not frequent visitors to Clearwater. So we think of those people as local tourists, people who would go once or twice a year, but not frequent enough to, to really be thought of as using this from a community standpoint. 
Um, I'm not going to get into the details of how we did the ridership summary. Um, it was comprehensive and it was used what's called streetlight data, which basically uses cell phone data. It anonymizes the cell phone data, creates origin and destination pairs, and then extrapolates that across the wider population. Um, according to the analysis that was done by one of our subconsultants, that would re uh, result in ridership of roughly 1.4 million riders per year. Um, and that's largely predicated on time savings due to traffic and the cost of parking. Those two things in combination are enough to justify a modal shift of about 1.4 million riders per year. We also estimate based upon our, our database that we have systems around the world that there'd be roughly about half a million novelty riders as well. You know, people who just are riding this for fun you know, if you're a tourist at the beach, you and your kids are going to wind up riding this just for fun because that's what happens in this industry. But the problem is we recognize that that half million may already be counted in that 1.4 million and we, we wanted to avoid double counting. So what we basically did is we said, okay, we're going to take an estimated ridership of 1.4 to 1.9 million and then we're going to sensitize our analysis in three different chunks along that, that range. Ultimately, it resulted in an 8.9% reduction in traffic on the causeway, and our fare is estimated at 15 bucks a day. This is actually low for cable car systems, but there's two factors here that were that, that caused us to want to drive down the price a little bit. A, you have an alternate way to get there. You know, a lot of cable cars, it's at the top of a mountain. There's no way you're getting up there unless you're hiking. So the reality is people are willing to pay that premium. In this situation, you can easily hop in your car, hop in a taxi, hop in an Uber, but of course you're gonna get stuck in traffic if, if there's traffic on that bridge. The last point is, of course, due to the high cost of parking in uh, Clearwater Beach, we felt that $15 was a good price point to look at because it basically said, you know, a family of four, 60 bucks, they leave their car, uh, you know, landside in downtown with marginal parking cost, and they avoid all the hassle of circling and trying to find a parking space and paying the $50, $60 a day that you can easily pay in, on the beach. Um, in terms of locals and beach employees, this is really important. The way this works in this industry is the tourists always subsidize the locals. It's just the way the market works. And basically what you do is with the locals or the <clears throat> beach employees, they would be entitled to purchase an annual pass or seasonal pass, what have you. And generally speaking, what we see is that for commuters who use that on a frequent basis, they're going to drive down their per trip cost to like a buck or less per trip over the course of a year. Um, in terms of delivery and financing, uh, this is all relatively preliminary. You know, we had consultations with city staff and some political actors in, in the city, but none of these are definitive at this stage. Um, city staff does believe that the project would need to be a PPP, a public private partnership. Many forms of PPP exist. Um, that's not been decided for this project at this stage of analysis. Uh, we have been told that city, the city may be willing to contribute modest funds to develop the project, and the city may be willing to, pro to provide co a conduit to municipal bonding. But again, that, that's a may, and that was from a small sample of people, so please don't hold me to that. Um, it is, however, being seen primarily as a private sector investment with some public sector involvement, whether that is you know, permitting agency or actual funding that has not been decided. The capital expenditure is in a range of 124 to $184 million. I know that's a wide range, but the reality is when you have that much optionality involved in where the stations are gonna be located, we kind of have no ability to zero in on exactly what it's gonna cost because of the fact that we have so much optionality we have to plan for. Annual operations and maintenance costs are gonna be about 10 million bucks plus minus 20%. And we conducted a discount cash flow analysis that revealed strong economics and financial indicators that we feel uh, should get interest from the private sector. Those numbers are included in the final study that will be posted online, I believe within the next month. Um, but generally speaking, what we've seen is aside from the absolute worst case scenario, the economics on this project are strong and should attract interest from the private sector. It would also create 89 full-time equivalent jobs and let's assume checks in the mail, permitting has been issued, approvals have been issued. It would only take eight, sorry, two years to implement after all of that. Um, lastly is the public support of the gondola. Uh, generally in the stakeholder component, when we met with people earlier in the process, they were very, very supportive in general. You know, not everyone was totally happy with it, but in general, I would say people were generally supportive of the project. 
We also did a very, very extensive public questionnaire, um, and that showed a very, very favorable impression. Uh, you probably saw this on the news, um, on your Facebook, on your Instagram. We, we use a wide variety of places to advertise this questionnaire, and it works really well. We got 8,300 responses, which is well above what we expected. And 17% of them were Clearwater residents. So it was just over 1,000 people were Clearwater residents, which represents a little, just about 1% of the population. And the key thing to understand is that these were all unique survey takers. It was one computer, one vote. You weren't able, it, your questionnaire was linked to your IP address. So maybe there would be some people who used a couple different computers to log multiple results, but the vast majority of them are gonna be unique visitors. 9% um, were Clearwater Beach employees, 33% were Pinellas County residents, non-Clearwater, and 48% were Florida residents outside Pinellas, we assume the greater Tampa Bay area. Uh, in terms of the results, 76% were familiar or very familiar with aerial gondolas. 73% were likely or very likely to use a gondola. 31 to travel to the beach, 38 to travel back and forth, which again reinforces this idea of a singular unified economic district of people moving back and forth between the destinations. Um, I should also mention that when we talked about the $15 fare, we thought of that as a day pass. So again, eliminating friction. You're not always reaching into your pocket to have to pay again, you get your day pass, ride it as much as you like. Um, lastly, and this one kind of surprised us, to be honest, 69% uh, of Clearwater residents were possibly or definitely open to city tax dollars being used for the project, and an uh, equivalent 69% of Pinellas County residents were possibly definitely open to county tax dollars being used for the project. Um, in terms of conclusions, aerial gondolas are suited to the Tampa Bay area, suitable alignments exist. The routes are technically feasible. The project is financially feasible at this stage of analysis, and the public is generally supportive of the project. In terms of the main talking points, if you guys want it, uh, you know, agree or disagree, but generally speaking, we see it as you know, the main talking points being the gondola would reduce traffic on the causeway. It would create a single unified economic district with little friction of movement between the major nodes. Stakeholders and the general public are in favor of the project. The project, the project is financially viable and should be financed by the private sector. The gondola would reduce time and cost of transportation to Clearwater Beach for locals and beach employees. And lastly, if Ford Pinellas likes this project, they should probably advocate it and prioritize it. And again, that's not us saying you should do that. It's us saying, this is the result of our study. This is what we found. And if it's something that you like and want to proceed forward, it's going to take, you know, you guys, you know, prioritizing it and, and working with the various partners and stakeholders to, to make it happen. Thanks. Any questions for Stephen? Hearing none. Stephen, thank you for your presentation. We appreciate you. And Whit, is there anything you want to add? No, I think that was a great presentation. This is... Um, as, as mentioned, was given to the city of Clearwater. So we're looking to the city of Clearwater to provide us with um, um, a request um, to consider prioritizing this at some point. I'm happy to, I, I do have a meeting with the city manager coming up, so I'd like to get his impressions one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Uh, but I think we came to this board, I wanna say in 2017, originally with this concept. So it's nice to see that we've, um, followed through with that. And I appreciate T. Barta for um, being able to support the study. Yes, Mayor. Julie. I just wanted to find out how the meeting went because I didn't see it, Dave. Like, what's your city feeling about it? I'm sorry. Your, your city council, she wants to know how it went. And you'll oh, need to put your microphone on. Microphone. Uh, it was real, well received. Um, I think most of the council are in favor of going forward with it, um, but we're gonna have a session where we talk about it, probably, hopefully by the end of the year. Thank you. And uh, with that, I think we're moving on to uh, upcoming events. And I just wanna remind everybody, I hope that you'll have it on your calendar that it is December, is it the 20th? Can we go in order here? Yes. On, on that yes, 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 yes. All right. Um, so first, uh, this Friday, we have a, uh, an elected officials uh, safety workshop. And I know several of you have signed up for that, and I appreciate that. I think we have almost 30 people who are registered. 
Uh, the department has put together a really good presentation uh, from their consultant, Farron Peers. Uh, former DOT Secretary Billy Hathaway will be part of the presentation team. Uh, and he was also the state uh, design engineer, so um, he really gets it. And uh, this will be an interactive session. And we have a companion session for technical staff on October 26th in advance of our technical coordinating committee meeting. So, um, and if anybody at, at the last minute wants to be able to go to this, we have capacity for some additional people to show up. And then uh, I wanted to mention on October 27th, we have our MPOAC uh, Advisory Council meeting in Orlando. I'll be attending that. Uh, I don't think we have any board members who will be going this time. Uh, and then we have our Gulf Coast Safe Street Summit in Polk County on November 3rd. And uh, I think they have well over 100 registrants now. So the thing you wanted to mention was December 14th. It is our uh, board workshop. And do you want to say anything more about that? You Mayor? said it was one to three. Three of our mayors will be speaking about the future of Pinellas County, and all of our partners will be invited, and um, I'm hoping that all of you will attend. It should be very enlightening, so. And the context for this is um, we are kicking off our long-range transportation plan, and I'm a big believer that anytime you develop that document, you need a really strong vision behind your plan. It can't just be a bunch of projects thrown together. So we really want to hear from you, what are the key issues that we as a countywide body need to focus on that are countywide priorities? And how do we advance those through our various mechanisms? So I think it'll be a productive discussion. We do have one more board meeting before that. You're getting out of here a little early today, but I want to warn you, our land use cases all got punted till November. We probably have a couple more, and then we have some other action items that we'll take in November. So uh, don't book an appointment at 3.30. Yes. Can I just add one more thing to the events calendar? Sure. October 20th, 2 p.m., Sunrunner Grand Opening at First Avenue North and Fifth Street. October 20th. I'll be there. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you for today.